Marissa Howe. I work at Kids in Need of Defense. I've been an immigration attorney not quite <laughs> as long, um, but for over a decade. Um, and so I've done uh, a lot of different types of immigration law. But right now, um, KIND is a national organization um, that has offices in 10 cities, including Boston. And we specifically work with unaccompanied children, so something um, Robert talked about. But um, just to give you an idea um, of sort of what it means to be considered an unaccompanied um, child, uh, be deemed that by uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It means that you've entered the United States, that you're under 18 and you've entered without a parent. So, you know, just think about that. That's children, as some as young as eight, or as old as 17 entering the United States, entering the southern border with no one, no caregiver with them. Um, and they're fleeing really horrific violence. 99% um, of our kids that we work with are from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. In 2015, uh, El Salvador was the murder capital of the world. Um, that's pretty unbelievable. Honduras was third. Um, so despite what you might hear in the news, <laughs> People aren't just deciding one day to have leave, they're really fleeing. Um, when they enter the United States, the children are held probably for a day or two at detention centers near the border, and then they're shel sent to shelters um, somewhere across the United States. And um, those shelters work with uh, the children to determine what their needs are. Um, you know, some kids are highly traumatized and they work to find the services, and then they'll find hopefully find a caregiver. Perhaps it's a parent that entered before them, or an aunt or an uncle, or something like that to take care of them. Um, they're still in deportation proceedings, and that's where KIND comes into play. So we um, either represent ourselves or represent through pro bono counsel volunteer attorneys um, to represent the children in the immigration court. And so um, two of the main forms of relief that our children are eligible for are asylum, which was already defined, so I won't go over it again, um, and something called special immigrant juvenile status. And that's something where you show that the child um, is under 21 and unmarried, and that reunification with one or both parents is not viable due to abuse, abandonment, or neglect of their parents. And that it's in the best interest of the child to remain here. And so we work with um, the attorneys and, and some degree um, with our with, uh, attorneys in our office to help children um, file those, those claims. It's, it's a process that an adult really can't go through themselves, let alone a child under the age of 18. Um, and just because um, we get a lot of questions about the executive orders <laughs> anytime we present, um, you know, uh, there are three executive orders on immigration that have been issued so far. The one that's gotten the most press, obviously, is the one that's now temporarily restrained as of Wednesday. Um, but the ones, and, and Joe will probably talk much more eloquently about it, um, that uh, kind we're really concerned about are really the ones that expand the ability to detain children um, and also um, that proactively take away a child's designation as an unaccompanied child, um, which in court can benefit them in the sense that they expedite the hearing, which I know sounds scary, but it's actually better for children, I think, not to have to wait five, six years to, to adjudicate their forms of relief. So that's kind of it. Hi, so I'm Jen Klein. I am an immigration lawyer in the public defender's office. So the state of Massachusetts has a statewide public defense system which means someone who is charged with a criminal offense, who um, is indigent, who meets certain poverty level um, considerations, gets appointed a defense attorney. That defense attorney is also obligated to understand for those of their clients that are non-citizens, what the consequences to their immigration status might be of these criminal charges. But defense attorneys aren't immigration attorneys and it's an incredibly complicated area. And so the public defender's office has a unit within it, um, there are three lawyers, whose job it is to advise and train defense attorneys on immigration issues. So all of my clients are non-citizens who are touching the criminal justice system in some way, who have been charged with a crime. Um, what's interesting to note is that people who are lawfully here so people with green cards, people on student visas, work visas, who are convicted of certain types of crimes, sometimes even very minor ones, are deportable. So someone who's had a green card for 40 years, um, who's convicted of sometimes very minor charges, can be deportable. The only, per the only type of person who's not safe is a US citizen. 
So we work with defense attorneys to understand the consequences, to try and mitigate them when they can. Um, and then work with those clients, sometimes through the process of removal hearings, um, if that's where they come, they end up. Um, I think what Marissa was alluding to with the executive orders is that the most press has been around this travel ban order, but there was an earlier order that focused on enforcement, which means who is immigration coming after? And it used to be, and I will be honest, under Obama it was not super awesome for people who had criminal records. They were always the focus of enforcement. Um, under President Trump it's just been exacerbated and made even worse. So instead of focusing on people with more serious offenses, anyone who is removable, so anyone who's undocumented or who has convictions for something that makes them removable, is a priority. Anyone removable who is charged with an offense is a priority, meaning there is an assumption of guilt over innocence under these new executive orders because a charge alone can be make you an enforcement priority. Immigration uses the criminal justice system as a way of catching up with people. It is much, much easier for immigration to show up in criminal court on a court date and arrest a non-citizen than it is to figure out where they live and to go to their home and catch up with them. Um, the new executive orders encourage municipalities to work with, or state and local municipalities to work with ICE, the federal government, to help to, to help enforcement. So it's trying to make local police officers uh, into ICE officers. That's why you're hearing a lot about sanctuary cities. Part of what sanctuary cities means is that local governments are saying, no, we won't help ICE do its job. Um, there are a lot of reasons why local um, police offices, police departments don't want to assist with ICE. It makes community policing much harder. It makes it so that someone who is either an, a victim or a witness to a crime might not go to the police because they're afraid that that police station is working with ICE. Um, I will also say that even when the person is the alleged perpetrator of an offense, you know, that perpetrator is still the brother, father, mother, sister of somebody. Um, and if ICE is going, if, if local police officers are working with immigration, even on the people that they think have committed the crime, it makes it hard for the community to trust that ICE is, that, that the police are working for their benefit. So I could talk forever, but I'm gonna <laughs> um, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, so I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Amy Stafford, and I'm Associate Director of Financial Aid uh, for the undergrad at Harvard, uh, as well as an admissions officer. Um, and so I, I deal with students um, as, as my job. I also do a lot of volunteering um, with NEPA, which is the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority. So I do presentations at local high schools um, and help out students who are going through the financial aid process um, and have certainly and in situations where um, both at Harvard um, as well as in my volunteer work, um, I've dealt with students who are either undocumented or have a DACA status. Um, there's been a lot, um, it was mentioned about sanctuary cities. There was a movement um, of trying to have some sanctuary campuses. Um, as far as I know, I think there was less than 15 that actually um, kind of declared themselves sanctuary campuses. Um, I know our own president of Harvard um, decided not to declare Harvard a sanctuary campus, um, but some of her reasons were the fact that um, that's not really a defined word, um, and that there's really no legal bearing um, if you define the campus as a sanctuary campus. So she didn't want to really en encourage that and give some sort of false sense to students um, that that was a protection. But what she did do um, <coughs> was to um, uh, listen to what students were saying and created an office on campus um, to increase efforts and outreach um, and support to the students that we do have. Um, I, I know for sure that the students who are either undocumented or have a DACA status at Harvard um, really are lucky in some ways as far as the amount of um, 
help that is afforded to them by the university as well as the amount of financial aid um, that is put forth for them and we help them with a variety um, of things other than tuition fees from the board. Um, and I know that um, one of the you know probably most frustrating things for, for a student um, who is in high school and is in one of these statuses and is thinking, you know, what where can I go um, for college? And unfortunately, um, it is something that isn't a standard process. Each school doesn't have the same amount of money or the same policies. So it's something that you have to look into. Um, but that there are many schools that you're able to attend. There is no federal law that says that, um, that students who are undocumented or have DACA status cannot enroll in school. Um, but it is up to um, individual universities as far as funding and what kind of funding is available through the university. Um, they cannot receive federal funding, um, but often university funding is more substantial, so it's a, a matter of looking into what schools might have available for you. Um, there are certainly websites out there that provide some information, but it really is important to reach out to um, schools themselves. Uh, schools are not, um, there are laws like FERPA, which is a family education um, rights protection law, so we're not able to announce, nor do most schools collect information uh, on um, the status of a student, but we're not unless under um, uh, a, a subpoena, um, we're not supposed to answer those questions. Most schools will have um, a particular point person, it might be in their general counsel's office where any request should come through. Um, and so, I'm happy to answer any questions um, as we get to that point, but that's kind of my role um, and my experience. Hi, good morning. I'm Tony Mikowski from Mira Coalition, which is the Massachusetts Immigrant Refugee Advocacy Coalition. Has anyone heard of us? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so we, we are a coalition of 130 members, maybe a little more, and we mostly do advocacy. So what is happening at the state house? What is happening at uh, local communities? affecting immigrants, whether it's sort of pro-immigrant or maybe there's some anti-immigrant bills that are out there. Um, again, it's all done in coalition, so there are a lot of groups that are coming together for advocacy. So there's something called the student immigrant movement, right? So looking at students who might not have status. Um, there's a safe driving coalition. Who can get a driver's license? Who can't? Um, there's keeping families together. You know, looking at how families are separated when there's deportation and one family member has to leave the United States. So that's one big piece of what we do. Um, and April 5th, so a couple of weeks, we have an Immigrants Day at the State House. Um, if you look at our website, there's information there. I know it's a school day, but um, you know, figure out how you might be able to help. So you know, we're, right now there's a call for people to call the governor and support something called the Safe Communities Act. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, Safe Communities is looking at how tax dollars are spent and helping on um, immigration enforcement. So, not if there was ever a Muslim registry, not using tax dollars in Massachusetts to support that registry. And, you know, you may have heard of sanctuary, trust communities, welcoming cities, they all kind of have different names with the same idea of so protecting community members. So, and then June 1st, we also have our annual gala. Um, and I only mention that if you're ever interested in volunteering. Um, it's a big event and you know, we could always use volunteers. But I also want to mention another program we have. Uh, it's helping people apply for citizenship. So does anyone know how you get your citizenship? No? Okay, so you've had your, yes. <laughs> so you've had your green card for five years, um, or three if you're married to a US citizen, and you have to pay a fee, it's $725 pretty expensive. Um, so you apply through U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and it's a 20-page application. It's pretty long. And there's a lot of questions about your criminal history. Have you ever been arrested? Are you a terrorist? Do you uh, smuggle drugs? So what we do is we have a workshop with volunteers who help people fill out this application. Uh, again, because it's pretty long and confusing, very detailed. Um, and also, if you're ever interested in volunteering, um, we've had from your school come volunteer. The other part of it is, I mentioned it's $725. There's a fee waiver. So we help people fill out a fee waiver so they don't have to pay that full price if they're low income. And the other piece is that there's a language requirement. 
So to get your citizenship, you have to speak English and learn civics. There are some exceptions on age or medical disabilities, but that's also a pretty, pretty difficult thing for people who are English as their second language, and they have to do a, you know, an interview reviewing this 20-page application in English. So there's a lot of classes um, around the, the state to help people with their prepare for their citizenship exam. And my last thing is, does anyone know how you become an immigration attorney? <laughs> So there's, there's not special law school for <laughs> immigration attorneys. So you go to law school, you take all the courses that everyone else does, you know, criminal, civil procedure, uh, property, contracts, even if you're never gonna do those things. And then you might have a chance to take a clinic. So you can actually practice being an attorney and you can go to court and you know, you have a supervisor, you're not by yourself, but you can learn how to, to, to do these cases or do an internship. So I'm sure you, you've all done internships or are thinking about internships or volunteering is another great way to get experience. So you don't go to law school specifically for immigration attorneys, it's law school for everyone, and you can find your focus there. We need to yeah, one <laughs> um, So the one thing I think we all left out um, is hope. Is hope. <laughs> um, it's a really scary time. And you know, we don't presume to know what everybody's family situations are, or life situations are. Um, Boston is an incredible place to live in this time, and there are resources available. So if people are scared, or parents need help, or there's, you know, you need to talk to an adult, by all means start with your teachers. Um, you now have all of our contact information. Um, but there are lawyers, and there are advocates, and there are people in this community to help. So please don't keep quiet and use us as a resource. 